Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Welcome back, Jeed. May I yai? <laughs> Auspicious day to get back. So, uh, 28th anniversary of Lung Cha's passing away. And I thought I would read from the collected teachings of Ajahn Chah. And also it ties in with the theme of the Buddha's practice and Ajahn Chah talking about his own practice. And hopefully we get to hear more from Lung Por this evening, Saturday night talk. And, and also uh, Lung Por Ban passed away one year ago today. And uh, he kind of got in there as a, trying to, maybe trying to make it less burdensome for us, or more convenient, and to celebrate two in one. <laughs> so he's hiding behind Lung Por Cha. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm just uh, starting in the chapter on unshakable peace it's page 436 <clears throat> the framework for Dhamma practice is the four noble truths suffering, dukkha the origin of suffering, samudaya the cessation of suffering, niroda and the path leading to the cessation of suffering, magga. This path consists of virtue, samadhi, and wisdom, the framework for training the heart. Their true meaning is not to be found in these words, but dwells in the depths of our hearts. That's what virtue, samadhi, and wisdom are like. They revolve continually. The Noble Eightfold <coughs> Path will envelop any sight, sound, smell, taste, bodily sensation, or object of mind that arises. However, if the factors of the Eightfold Path are weak and timid, the defilements will possess our minds. If the Noble Path is strong and courageous, it will conquer and destroy the defilements. If the defilements are powerful and brave, while the path is feeble and frail, the defilements will conquer the path. They conquer our hearts. If the knowing isn't quick and nimble enough as forms, feelings, perceptions, and thoughts are experienced, they possess and devastate us. The path and the defilements proceed in tandem. As Dhamma practice and develops in the heart, these two forces have to battle it out every step of the way. It's as though there are two people arguing inside the mind, but it's just the path of Dhamma and the defilements struggling to win domination of the heart. <clears throat> the path guides and fosters our ability to contemplate. As long as we are able to contemplate accurately, the defilements will be losing ground. But if we are shaky, whenever defilements regroup and regain their strength, the path will be routed as defilements take its place. The two sides will continue to fight it out until eventually there is a victor and the whole affair is settled. That seems a little bit loud on the uh, speakers. Is that... <clears throat> If we focus our endeavor to, on developing the way of Dhamma, defilements will be gradually and persistently eradicated. Once fully cultivated, the Four Noble Truths reside in our hearts. Whatever form suffering takes, it always exists due to a cause. That's the Second Noble Truth. And what is the cause? Weak virtue, weak samadhi, weak wisdom. When the path isn't durable, the defilements dominate the mind. When they dominate, the second noble truth comes into play and it gives rise to all sorts of suffering. Once we are suffering, those qualities which are able to quell the suffering disappear. The conditions which give rise to the path are virtue, samadhi, and wisdom. When they have attained full strength, the path of Dhamma is unstoppable, advancing unceasingly to overcome the attachment and clinging that bring us so much anguish. Suffering can't arise because the path is destroying the defilements. It's at this point that cessation of suffering occurs. Why is the path able to bring about the cessation of suffering? 
because virtue, samadhi, and wisdom are attaining their peak of perfection and the path has gathered an unstoppable momentum. It all comes together right here. I would say for anyone who practices like this, theoretical ideas about the mind don't come into the picture. If the mind is liberated from these, then it is utterly dependable and certain. Now, whatever path it takes, we don't have to goad it much to keep it going straight. Consider the leaves of a mango tree. What are they like? By examining just a single leaf, we know. Even if there are 10,000 of them, we know what all those leaves are like. Just look at one leaf. The others are essentially the same. Similarly with the trunk. We only have to see the trunk of one mango tree to know the characteristics of them all. Just look at one tree. All the other mango trees will essentially be no different. Even if there were 100,000 of them, if you know one of them, you'd know them all. This is what the Buddha taught. Virtue, samadhi, and wisdom constitute the path of the Buddha. But the way is not the essence of the Dhamma. The path isn't an end in itself, not the ultimate aim of the Blessed One, but it's the way leading inwards. It's just like how you traveled from Bangkok to my monastery, Wat Bapong. It's not the road you were after. What you wanted was to reach the monastery, but you needed the road for the journey. The road you traveled on is not the monastery. It's just the way to get here. But if you want to arrive at the monastery, you have to follow the road. It's the same with virtue, samadhi, and wisdom. We could say they are not the essence of the Dhamma, but they are the road to arrive there. When virtue, samadhi, and wisdom have been mastered, the result is profound peace of mind. That's the destination. Once we've arrived at this peace, even if we hear a noise, the mind remains unruffled. Once we've reached this peace, there's nothing remaining to do. The Buddha taught to give it all up. Whatever happens, there's nothing to worry about. Then we truly, unquestionably know for ourselves. We no longer simply believe what other people say. The essential principle of Buddhism is empty of any phenomena. It's not contingent upon miraculous displays of psychic powers, paranormal abilities, or anything else mystical or bizarre. The Buddha did not emphasize the importance of these things. Such powers, however, do exist and may be possible to develop. But this facet of Dhamma is deluding, so the Buddha did not advocate or encourage it. The only people he praised were the ones who were able to liberate themselves from suffering. To accomplish this requires training, and the tools and equipment to get the job done are generosity, virtue, samadhi, and wisdom. We have to take them up and train with them. Together they form a path inclining inwards, and wisdom is the first step. This path cannot mature if the mind is encrusted with defilements, but if we are stout-hearted and strong, the path will eliminate these impurities. However, if it's the defilements that are stout-hearted and strong, they will destroy the path. Dhamma practice simply involves these two forces battling it out incessantly until the end of the road is reached. They engage in unremitting battle until the very end. Using the tools of practice entails hardship and arduous challenges. We rely on patience, endurance, and going without. We have to do it ourselves, experience it for ourselves, realize it ourselves. Scholars, however, tend to get confused a lot. For example, when they sit in meditation, as soon as their minds experience a teeny bit of tranquility, they start to think, hey, this must be the first jhana. This is how their minds work. And once those thoughts arise, the tranquility they'd experienced is shattered. Soon they start to think that it must have been the second jhana they'd attained. Don't think and speculate about it. There aren't any billboards which announce which level of samadhi we're experiencing. The reality is completely different. There aren't any signs like the road signs that tell you this way to Wat Nong Papong. That's not how I read the mind. It doesn't announce. Although a number of highly esteemed scholars have written descriptions of the first, second, third, and fourth jhana, what's written is merely external information. If the mind actually enters these states of profound peace, it doesn't know anything about those written descriptions. It knows, but what it knows isn't the same as the theory we study. If the scholars try to clutch their theory and drag it into their meditation, sitting and pondering, hmm, what could this be? Is this the first jhana yet? 
there, the peace is shattered and they don't experience anything of real value. And why is that? Because there is desire and once there's craving, what happens? The mind simultaneously withdraws out of the meditation. So it's necessary for all of us to relinquish thinking and speculation. Abandon them completely. Just take up the body, speech, and mind and delve entirely into the practice. Observe the workings of the mind, but don't lug the Dhamma books in there with you. Otherwise, everything becomes a big mess because nothing in those books corresponds precisely to the reality of the way things truly are. People who study a lot, who are full of theoretical knowledge, usually don't succeed in Dhamma practice. They get bogged down at the information level. The truth is, the heart and mind can't be measured by external standards. If the mind is getting peaceful, just allow it to be peaceful. The most profound levels of deep peace do exist. Personally, I didn't know much about the theory of practice. I'd been a monk for three years and still had a lot of questions about what samadhi actually was. I kept trying to think about it and figure it out as I meditated, but my mind became even more restless and distracted than it had been before. The amount of thinking actually increased. When I wasn't meditating, it was more peaceful. Boy, was it difficult, so exasperating. But even though I encountered so many obstacles, I never threw in the towel. I just kept on doing it. When I wasn't trying to do anything in particular, my mind was relatively at ease. But whenever I determined to make the mind unify in samadhi, it went out of control. What's going on here, I wondered. Why is this happening? Later on, I began to realize that meditation was comparable to the process of breathing. If we're determined to force the breath to be shallow, deep, or just right, it's very difficult to do. However, if we go for a stroll and we're not even aware of when we're breathing in or out, it's extremely relaxing. So I reflected, aha, maybe that's the way it works. When a person is normally walking around in the course of the day, not focusing attention on their breath, does their breathing cause them suffering? No, they just feel relaxed. But when I'd sit down and vow with determination that I was going to make my mind peaceful, clinging and attachment set in. When I tried to control the breath to be shallow or deep, it just brought on more stress than I had before. Why? Because the willpower I was using was tainted with clinging and attachment. I didn't know what was going on. All that frustration and hardship was coming up because I was bringing craving into the meditation. I once stayed in a forest monastery that was half a mile from a village. One night, the villagers were celebrating with a loud party as I was doing walking meditation. It must have been after 11 p.m. and I was feeling a bit peculiar. I'd been feeling strange like this since midday. My mind was quiet. There were hardly any thoughts. I felt very relaxed and at ease. I did walking meditation until I was tired and then went to sit in my grass-roofed hut. As I sat down, I barely had time to cross my legs before. <coughs> Amazingly, my mind just wanted to delve into a profound state of peace. It happened all by itself. As soon as I sat down, the mind became truly peaceful. It was rock solid. It wasn't as if I could hear the noise. It wasn't as if I couldn't hear the noise of the villagers singing and dancing. I still could, but I could also shut the sound out entirely. Strange. When I didn't pay attention to the sound, it was perfectly quiet. I didn't hear a thing. But if I wanted to hear, I could, without it being a disturbance. It was like there were two objects in my mind that were placed side by side, but not touching. I could see that the mind and its object of awareness were separate and distinct, just like this spittoon and water kettle here. Then I understood. When the mind unifies in samadhi, if you direct your attention outward, you can hear. But if you let it dwell in its emptiness, then it's perfectly silent. When sound was perceived, I could see that the knowing and the sound were distinctly different. I contemplated, if this isn't the way it is, how else could it be? That's the way it was. These two things were totally separate. I continued investigating like this until my understanding deepened even further. Ah, this is important. When the perceived continuity of phenomena is cut, the result is peace. The previous illusion of continuity, santati, transformed into peace of mind, santi. 
So I continued to sit, putting effort into the meditation. The mind at that time was focused solely on the meditation, indifferent to, any, to everything else. Had I stopped meditating at this point, it would have been merely because I was complete, because it was complete. I could have taken it easy, but it wouldn't have been because of laziness, tiredness, or feeling annoyed, not at all. These were absent from the heart. There was only perfect inner balance and equipoise, just right. Eventually I did take a break, but it was only the posture of sitting that changed. My heart remained constant, unwavering and unflagging. I pulled a pillow over, intending to take a rest. As I reclined, the mind remained just as peaceful as it had been before. Then, just before my head hit the pillow, the mind's awareness began flowing inwards. I didn't know where it was headed, but it kept flowing deeper and deeper within. It was like a current of electricity flowing down a cable to a switch. When it hit the switch, my body exploded with a deafening bang. The knowing during that time was extremely lucid and subtle. Once past that point, the mind was released to penetrate deeply inside. It went inside to the point where there wasn't anything at all. Absolutely nothing from the outside world could come into that place. Nothing at all could reach it. Having dwelt internally for some time, the mind then retreated to flow back out. However, when I say it retreated, I don't mean to imply that I made it flow back out. I was simply an observer, only knowing and witnessing. The mind came out more and more until finally it returned to normal. Once my normal state of consciousness returned, the question arose, what was that? The answer came immediately, these things happen of their own accord. You don't have to search for an explanation. This answer was enough to satisfy my mind. After a short time, my mind again began flowing inwards. I wasn't making any conscious effort to direct the mind. It took off by itself. As it moved deeper and deeper inside, it again hit that same switch. This time, my body shattered into the most minute particles and fragments. Again, the mind was released to penetrate deeply inside itself, utter silence. It was even more profound than the first time. Absolutely nothing external could reach it. The mind abided here for some time, for as long as it wished, and then retreated to flow outwards. At that time, it was following its own momentum and happened all by itself. It wasn't influence, I wasn't influencing or directing my mind to be in any particular way to flow inwards or retreat outwards. I was merely the one knowing and watching. My mind again returned to its normal state of consciousness and I didn't wonder or speculate about what was happening. As I meditated, the mind once again inclined inwards. This time the entire cosmos shattered and disintegrated into minute particles. The earth, ground, mountains, fields and forests, the whole world, disintegrated into the space element. People had vanished, everything had disappeared. On this third time, absolutely nothing remained. The mind, having inclined inwards, settled down there for as long as it wished. I can't say I understand exactly how it remained there. It's difficult to describe what happened. There's nothing I can compare it to. No simile is apt. This time, the mind remained inside far longer than it had previously and only after some time did it come out of that state. When I say it came out, I don't mean to imply that I made it come out or that I was controlling what was happening. The mind did it all by itself. I was merely an observer. Eventually it again returned to its normal state of consciousness. How could you put a name on what happened during these three times? Who knows? What term are you going to use to label it? <clears throat> Just to insert a brief comment there that many people have speculated on what this experience of Lung Chas was, and uh, I think that's a good question. What term are you going to use to label it? Because uh, he never says exactly what it was, but uh, just leave it, sort of leave it hanging there. <clears throat> Everything I've been relating to you concerns the mind following the way of nature. This was no theoretical description of the mind or of psychological states. There's no need for that. 
when there's faith or confidence, you get in there and really do it. Not just playing around, you put your life on the line. And when your practice reaches the stage that I've been describing, afterwards the whole world is turned upside down. Your understanding of reality is completely different. Your view is utterly transformed. If someone saw you at that moment, they might think you were insane. If this experience happened to someone who didn't have a thorough grip on themselves, they might actually go crazy because nothing is the same as it was before. The people of the world appear differently from how, from how they used to, but, but you're the only one who sees this. Absolutely everything changes. Your thoughts are transmuted. Other people now think in one way while you think in another. They speak about things in one way while you speak in another. They're descending one path while you're climbing another. You're no longer the same as other human beings. This way of experiencing things doesn't deteriorate. It persists and carries on. Give it a try. If it really is as I describe, you won't have to go searching very far. Just look into your own heart. This heart is staunchly courageous, unshakably bold. This is the heart's power, its source of strength and energy. The heart has this potential strength. This is the power and force of samadhi. At this point, it's still just the power and purity that the mind derives from samadhi. This level of samadhi is samadhi at its ultimate. The mind has attained the summit of samadhi. It's not mere momentary concentration. If you were to switch to vipassana meditation at this point, the contemplation would be uninterrupted and insightful or you could take that focused energy and use it in other ways. From this point on, you could develop psychic powers, perform miraculous feats, or use it in any way you wanted. Ascetics and hermits have used samadhi energy for making holy water, talismans, or casting spells. These things are all possible at this stage and may be of some benefit in their own way, but it's like the benefit of alcohol. You drink it and then you get drunk. This level of samadhi is a rest stop. The Buddha stopped and rested here. It forms the foundation for contemplation and vipassana. However, it's not necessary to have such profound samadhi as this in order to observe the conditions around us. So keep on steadily contemplating the process of cause and effect. To do this, we focus the peace and clarity of our minds to analyze the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, physical sensations, thoughts, and mental states we experience. Examine moods and emotions, whether positive or negative, happy or unhappy. Examine everything. It's as though someone else has climbed up a mango tree and is shaking down the fruit while we wait underneath to gather them up. The ones which are rotten we don't pick up. Just gather the good mangoes. It's not exhausting because we don't have to climb up the tree. We simply wait underneath to reap the fruit. Do you get the meaning of this simile? Everything experienced with a peaceful mind confers greater understanding. No longer do we create proliferating interpretations around what is experienced. Wealth, fame, blame, praise, happiness and unhappiness come of their own accord. And we're at peace. We're wise. It's actually fun. It becomes fun to sift through and sort out these things. What other people call good, bad, evil, here, there, happiness, unhappiness, or whatever, it all gets taken in for our own profit. Someone else has climbed up the mango tree and is shaking the branches to make the mangoes fall down to us. We simply enjoy ourselves, gathering the fruit without fear. What's there to be afraid of anyway? It's someone else who's shaking the mangoes down to us. Wealth, fame, praise, criticism, happiness, unhappiness, and all the rest are no more than mangoes falling down, and we examine them with a serene heart. Then we'll know which ones are good and which are rotten. When we begin to wield the peace and serenity we've been developing in meditation to contemplate these things, wisdom arises. This is what I call wisdom. This is vipassana. It's not something fabricated and construed. If we're wise, vipassana will develop naturally we don't have to label what's happening. If there's only a little clarity of insight, we call this little vipassana. When clear seeing increases a bit, we call that moderate vipassana. 
If knowing is fully in accordance with the truth, we call that ultimate vipassana. Personally, I prefer to use the word panya, wisdom, rather than vipassana. If we think we are going to sit down from time to time and practice vipassana meditation, we're going to have a very difficult time of it. Insight has to proceed from peace and tranquility. The entire process will happen naturally of its own accord. We can't force it. The Buddha taught that this process matures at its own rate. Having reached this level of practice, we allow it to develop according to our innate capabilities, spiritual aptitude, and the merit we've accumulated in the past. But we never stop putting effort into the practice. Whether the process is swift or slow is out of our control. It's just like planting a tree. The tree knows how fast it should grow. If we want it to grow more quickly than it is, this is pure delusion. If we want it to grow more slowly, recognize this is delusion as well. If we do the work, the results will be forthcoming, just like planting a tree. For example, say we wanted to plant a chili bush. Our responsibility is to dig a hole, plant the seedling, water it, fertilize it, and protect it from insects. This is our job, our end of the bargain. This is where faith then comes in. Whether the chili plant grows or not is up to it. It's not our business. We can't go tugging on the plant, trying to stretch it and make it grow faster. That's not how nature works. Our responsibility is to water and fertilize it. Practicing Dhamma in the same way puts our heart at ease. If we realize enlightenment in this lifetime, that's fine. If we have to wait until our next life, no matter. We have faith and unfaltering conviction in the Dhamma. Whether we progress quickly or slowly is up to our innate capabilities, spiritual aptitude, and the merit we've accumulated thus far. Practicing like this puts the heart at ease. It's like we're riding in a horse cart. We don't put the cart before the horse. Or it's like trying to plow a rice paddy while walking in front of our water buffalo rather than behind. What I'm saying here is that the mind is getting ahead of itself. It's impatient to get quick results. That's not the way to do it. Don't walk in front of your water buffalo. You have to walk behind the water buffalo. It's just like that chili plant we are nurturing. Give it water and fertilizer and it will do the job of absorbing the nutrients. When ants or termites come to infest it, we chase them away. Doing just this much is enough for the chili to grow beautifully on its own. And once it is growing beautifully, we don't try to force it to flower when, when we think it should flower. It's none of our business. It will just create useless suffering. Allow it to bloom on its own. And once the flowers do bloom, don't demand that it immediately produce chili peppers. Don't rely on coercion. That really causes suffering. Once we figure this out, we understand what our responsibilities are and what they are not. Each has their specific duty to fulfill. The mind knows its role in the work to be done. If the mind doesn't understand its role, it will try to force the chili plant to produce peppers on the very day we plant it. The mind will insist that it grow, flower, and produce peppers all in one day. This is nothing but the second noble truth. Craving causes suffering to arise. If we are aware of this truth and ponder it, we'll understand that trying to force results in our Dhamma Dhamma practice is pure delusion. It's wrong. Understanding how it works, we let go and allow things to mature according to our innate capabilities, spiritual aptitude, and the merit we've accumulated. We keep doing our part. Don't worry that it might take a long time. Even if it takes a hundred or a thousand lifetimes to get enlightened, so what? However many lifetimes it takes, we just keep practicing with a heart at ease, comfortable with our pace. Once our mind has entered the stream, there's nothing to fear. It will have gone beyond even the smallest evil action. The Buddha said that the mind of a sotapanna, someone who has attained the first stage of enlightenment, has entered the stream of Dhamma that flows to enlightenment. These people will never again have to experience the grim lower realms of existence, never again fall into hell. How could they possibly fall into hell when their minds have abandoned evil? They've seen the danger in making bad kama. Even if you tried to force them to do or say something evil, they would be incapable of it. 
So there's no chance of ever again descending into hell or the lower realms of existence. Their minds are flowing with the current of Dhamma. Once you're in the stream, you know what your responsibilities are. You comprehend the work ahead. You understand how to practice Dhamma. You know when to strive hard and when to relax. You comprehend your body and mind, this physical and mental process, and you renounce the things that should be renounced, continually abandoning without a shred of doubt. In my life of practicing Dhamma, I didn't attempt to master a wide range of subjects, just one. I refined this heart. Say we look at a body. If we find that we're attracted to a body, then analyze it. Have a good look. Head hair, body hair, nails, teeth, and skin. The Buddha taught us to thoroughly and repeatedly contemplate these parts of the body, visualize them separately, pull them apart, peel off the skin and burn them up. This is how, this is how to do it. Stick with this meditation until it's firmly established and unwavering. See everyone the same. For example, when the monks and novices go into the village on alms round in the morning, whoever they see, whether it's another monk or a villager, they imagine him or her as a dead body, a walking corpse staggering along on the road ahead of them. Remain focused on this perception. This is how to put forth effort. It leads to maturity and development. When you see a young woman who you find attractive, Imagine her as a walking corpse, her body putrid and reeking from decomposition. See everyone like that, and don't let them get too close. Don't allow the infatuation to persist in your heart. If you perceive others as putrid and reeking, I can assure you the infatuation won't persist. Contemplate this until you're sure about what you're seeing, until it's definite, until you're proficient. Whatever path you then wander down, you won't go astray. Put your whole heart into it. Whenever you see someone, it's no different from looking at a corpse. Whether male or female, look at that person as a dead body. And don't forget to see yourself as a dead body. Eventually, that is all that's left. Try to develop this way of seeing as thoroughly as you can. Train with it until it increasingly becomes part and parcel of your mind. I promise it's great fun if you actually do it. But if you are preoccupied with reading about it in books, you'll have a difficult time of it. You've got to do it, and do it with utmost sincerity. Do it until this meditation becomes part of you. Make realization of truth your aim. If you're motivated by the desire to transcend suffering, then you'll be on the right path. These days, there are many people teaching vipassana and a wide range of meditation techniques. I'll say this, doing vipassana is not easy. We can't just jump straight into it. It won't work if it's not proceeding from a high standard of morality. Find out for yourself. Moral discipline and training precepts are necessary because if our behavior, actions, and speech aren't impeccable, we'll never be able to stand on our own two feet. Meditation without virtue is like trying to skip over an essential section of the path. Similarly, occasionally you hear people say, you don't need to develop tranquility. Skip over it and go straight to insight meditation of vipassana. Sloppy people who like to cut corners say things like this. They say you don't have to bother with moral discipline. Upholding and refining your virtue is challenging, not just playing around. If we could skip over all the teachings on ethical behavior, we'd have it pretty easy, wouldn't we? Whenever we'd encounter a difficulty, we just avoid it by skipping over it. Of course, we'd all like to skip over the difficult bits. There was once a monk I met who told me he was a real meditator. He asked for permission to stay with me here and inquired about the schedule and standard of monastic discipline. I explained to him that in this monastery we live according to the Vinaya, the Buddha's code of monastic discipline, and if he wanted to come and train with me, he'd have to renounce his money and private supplies of goods. He told me his practice was non-attachment, non-attachment to all conventions. I told him I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> How about if I stay here, he asked, and keep all my money but don't attach to it. Money's just a convention. I said, sure, no problem. If you can eat salt and not find it salty, then you can use money and not be attached to it. He was just speaking gibberish. Actually, he was just too lazy to follow the details of the Vinaya. I'm telling you, it's difficult. 
When you can eat salt and honestly assure me it's not salty, then I'll take you seriously. And if you tell me it's not salty, then I'll give you a whole sack to eat. Just try it. Will it really not taste salty? Non-attachment to conventions isn't just a matter of clever speech. If you're going to talk like this, you can't stay with me. So he left. <laughs> we have to try and maintain the practice of virtue. Monastics should train by experimenting with the ascetic practices, tutanga, while lay people practicing at home should keep the five precepts. Attempt to attain impeccability in everything said and done. We should cultivate goodness to, be the be to the best of our ability and keep on gradually doing it. When starting to cultivate the serenity of samatha meditation, don't make the mistake of trying once or twice and then giving up because the mind is not peaceful. That's not the right way. You have to cultivate meditation over a long period of time. Why does it have to take so long? Think about it. How many years have we allowed our minds to wander astray? How many years have we not been doing samatha meditation? Whenever the mind has ordered us to follow it down a particular path, we've rushed after it. To calm that wandering mind, to bring it to a stop, to make it still, a couple of months of meditation won't be enough. Consider this. When we undertake to train the mind to be at peace with every situation, please understand that in the beginning, when a defiled emotion comes up, the mind won't be peaceful. It's going to be distracted and out of control. Why? Because there's craving. We don't want our mind to think. We, want, we don't want to experience any distracting moods or emotions. Not wanting is craving, the craving for non-existence. The more we crave not to experience certain things, the more we invite and usher them in. I don't want these things, so why do they keep coming to me? I wish it wasn't this way, so why is it this way? There we go. We crave for things to exist in a particular way because we don't understand our own mind. It can take an incredibly long time before we realize that playing around with these things is a mistake. Finally, when we consider it clearly, we see, oh, these things come because I call them. Craving not to experience something, craving to be at peace, craving not to be distracted and agitated, it's all craving. It's all a red hot chunk of iron, but never mind, just get on with the practice. Whenever we experience a mood or emotion, Examine it in terms of its impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selfless qualities, and toss it, on, toss it into one of these three categories. Then reflect and investigate. These defiled emotions are almost always accompanied by excessive thinking. Wherever a mood leads, thinking straggles along behind. Thinking and wisdom are two very different things. Thinking merely reacts to and follows our moods and thoughts carry on with no end in sight. But if wisdom is operating, it will bring the mind to stillness. The mind stops and doesn't go anywhere. There's simply knowing and acknowledging what's being experienced. When this emotion comes, the mind's like this. When that mood comes, it's like that. We sustain this knowing. Eventually it occurs to us, hey, all this thinking, this aimless mental chatter, this worrying and judging, it's all insubstantial nonsense. It's all impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not me or mine. Toss it into one of these three all-encompassing categories and quell the uprising. You cut it off at its source. Later, when we again sit in meditation, it will come up again. Keep a close watch on it. Spy on it. It's just like raising water buffaloes. You've got the farmer, some rice plants, and the water buffalo. Now the water buffalo wants to eat those rice plants. Rice plants are what the water buffaloes like to eat, right? Your mind is a water buffalo. Defiled emotions are like the rice plants. The knowing is the farmer. Dhamma practice is just like this. No different. Compare it for yourself. When tending a water buffalo, what do you do? You release it, allowing it to wander freely, but you keep a close eye on it. If it strays too close to the rice plants, you yell out. When the buffalo hears, it backs away. Don't be inattentive, oblivious to what the buffalo is doing. If you've got a stubborn water buffalo you won't, that won't heed your warning, then take a stick and give it a stout whack on the backside. Then it won't dare go near the rice plants. Don't get caught taking a siesta. If you lie down and doze off, those rice plants will be history. 
Dhamma practice is the same. You watch over your mind. The knowing tends to the mind. Those people who keep a close watch over their minds will be liberated from Mara's snare. And yet this knowing mind is also the mind. So who is the one observing the mind? Such ideas can make you extremely confused. The mind is one thing, the knowing another. And yet the knowing originates in this very same mind. What does it mean to know the mind? What's it like to encounter moods and emotions? What's it like to be without any defiled emotions whatsoever? That which knows what these things are is what is meant by the knowing. The knowing observantly follows the mind. And it's from this knowing that wisdom is born. The mind is that which thinks and gets entangled in emotions, one after another, precisely like our water buffalo. Whatever direction it strays in, maintain a watchful eye. How could it get away? If it starts to drift over toward the rice plants, yell out. If it won't listen, if it won't listen, pick up a stick and stride over to it. Whack. This is how you frustrate craving. Training the mind is no different. When the mind experiences an emotion and instantly grabs it, it's the job of the knowing to teach. Examine the mood to see if it's good or bad. Explain to the mind how cause and effect functions. And when it again grabs onto something that it thinks is adorable, the knowing has to again teach the mind, again explain cause and effect, until the mind is able to cast that thing aside. This leads to peace of mind. After finding out that whatever it grabs and grasps is inherently undesirable, the mind simply stops. It can't be bothered with those things anymore because it's come under a constant barrage of rebukes and reprimands. Thwart the craving of the mind with determination. Challenge it to its core until the teachings penetrate to the heart. That's how you train the mind. Since the time I withdrew to the forest to practice meditation, I've been practicing like this. When I train my disciples, I train them to practice like this because I want them to see the truth rather than just read what's in the scriptures. I want them to see if their hearts have been liberated from conceptual thinking. When liberation occurs, you know, and when liberation has not yet happened, then contemplate the process of how one thing causes and leads to another. Contemplate until you know and understand it through and through. Once it's been penetrated with insight, it will fall away on its own. When something comes your way and gets stuck, investigate it. Don't give up until it has released its grip. Repeatedly investigate right here. Personally, this is how I approached the training, because the Buddha taught that you have to know for yourself. All sages know the truth for themselves. You've got to discover it in the depths of your own heart. Know yourself. If you're confident in what you know and trust yourself, you will feel relaxed whether others criticize or praise you. Whatever other people say, you're at ease. Why? Because you know yourself. If someone bolsters you with praise, but you know you're not actually worthy of it, are you really going to believe them? Of course not. You just carry on with your Dhamma practice. When people who aren't confident in what they know get praised by others, they get sucked into believing it and it warps their perception. Likewise, when someone criticizes you, take a look at it and examine yourself. No, what they say isn't true. They accuse me of being wrong, but actually I'm not. Their accusation isn't valid. If that's the case, what would be the point of getting angry with them? Their words aren't true. If, however, we are at fault just as they accuse, then their criticism is correct. If that's the case, what would be the point of getting angry with them? When you're able to think like this, life is truly untroubled and comfortable. Nothing that happens is, nothing that then happens is wrong. Then everything is Dhamma. This is how I practiced. <laughs>